This is Timmy, young, adventurous boy with no care in the world. One sunny afternoon while chasing butterflies, Timmy took a tumble. Let us get you good as new. I know just the right procedure. Oh no. Throughout history, humanity has exhibited a relentless pursuit of remedies for ailments often rooted in a blend of folklore, superstition, and limited medical understanding. From tobacco smoke enemas to trepanation and even the bizarre practice of sitting inside rotting whale carcasses, the annals of medical history are replete with treatments that now appear absurd, if not downright dangerous. It's wild to think about how humanity was just throwing spaghetti at the wall when it came to medical treatments, hoping something would stick. But man, did they miss the mark big time. In this exploration, we delve into the scientific underpinnings of these historical medical treatments, dissecting their purported mechanisms and examining why they ultimately failed the test of scientific scrutiny. Let's kick off our expedition with the enigmatic tale of tobacco smoke enemas. Imagine you're feeling under the weather in the 1700s. You stroll into a doctor's office, and instead of handing you a pill or checking your pulse, they decide to pump tobacco smoke into your bottom. How? Well, they had these special contraptions. Basically, a tube attached to a bellows, like what you use to blow air into a fire. They'd light some tobacco, blow smoke through the tube. Doctors figured tobacco smoke was a miracle cure. They thought nicotine, the stuff that gives tobacco its kick, could somehow oh, wake yeah. up your body, like Superman rising from the ashes using a mother box. They believed it would make your adrenal glands release adrenaline, which could, in theory, jumpstart your system, and bring you back from the brink of death. We now know that tobacco smoke is bad news bears, like really bad. It's jam-packed with all kinds of nasty chemicals, including ones that can give you cancer and mess up your lungs. As for the whole adrenaline thing, turns out there's zero evidence to back that up. Xenotransplantation. Next stop brings us face to face with the intriguing world of xenotransplantation. In the 1920s, when Viagra was just a twinkle in the eye of future scientists, people were getting pretty desperate for solutions to their, uh, bedroom problems. Dr. Serge Voronov and his eyebrow-raising procedure involving monkey glands. If you had the cash and the courage, you might have headed to Paris to see Dr. Voronov. His solution? Swap out your tired old private parts with fresh ones from a monkey. This sounds more like Dr. Frankenstein. This procedure, called xenotransplantation, involved grafting the interstitial gland from a chimpanzee onto a human. The idea was that these monkey glands would inject some much needed vigor back into your life. They thought, hey, monkeys are pretty close to humans, so their glands must work just as well, right? Plus, they didn't have many other options on the table for treating conditions like erectile dysfunction. So, Desperate times called for desperate measures. While xenotransplantation might sound like something out of a sci-fi movie, it's definitely not a viable solution. Not only is it ethically questionable to use animal parts in humans, but it's also incredibly risky. Sitting inside a rotting whale carcass. Now brace yourselves for a tale as twisted as a chapter from Moby Dick, sitting inside a rotting whale carcass. Yes, you heard that right. In the 19th century, down on Australia's southern coast, folks suffering from rheumatism found themselves immersing in the decaying remains of a whale, akin to Captain Ahab's relentless pursuit of the elusive white whale. The belief? Spending 30 hours within the festering belly of the beast would grant relief from joint aches for a whole year, like a blessing bestowed upon the brave and the foolish alike. But let's face it, sitting inside a rotting whale carcass is about as effective as trying to tame Moby Dick himself. It's recognized as nothing more than a bizarre and futile endeavor, leaving sufferers still shackled to the chains of their afflictions. Trepanation. This eerie procedure, reminiscent of a scene straight out of the X-Files, involves drilling a hole into someone's skull without any anesthesia and dates back to the Mesolithic era. Sounds like a plotline Mulder and Scully would investigate, doesn't it? Now, why on earth would anyone subject themselves to such a gruesome ordeal? Well, back then, trepanation was steeped in mysticism and ritual. Folks believed it could release evil spirits, wreaking havoc in the noggin, causing everything from mental illness to migraines and epileptic seizures. 
As time marched on, trepanation evolved from a mystical ritual to a bona fide medical intervention. It became a go-to treatment for head injuries, like skull fractures and bone contusions. Sure, there were uh, observations made about its effects, like Galen's cautionary tale about pressing too hard during skull fracture treatments. But the underlying rationale? Let's just say it was more rooted in superstition than science. Today, trepanation is seen for what it truly is, a dangerous and ineffective treatment. Sure, it might have seemed like a good idea back then, but the risks far outweighed any potential benefits. Think infection, brain damage, and yes, even death. Milk transfusions. Next up on our expedition, we encounter the curious case of milk transfusions. Imagine a world where milk could magically replace blood. Sounds like something straight out of a fairy tale, doesn't it? In the late 1800s, people believed that the fatty goodness of milk could transform into white blood cells. So they did what any adventurous souls would do. They injected milk straight into their veins. And believe it or not, sometimes it seemed to work. There were tales of people miraculously getting better after a milk transfusion. But reality has a cruel sense of humor. Injecting milk into your veins is a recipe for disaster, like trying to cast a spell with a broken wand. It's bound to go wrong. Instead of transforming into blood cells, milk can cause clotting, organ damage, and even death. And let's not forget about the risk of allergic reactions. Whirling chairs. Imagine you're seated in a chair modified with springs and levers, like something out of a steampunk roller coaster. The doctors start cranking it up, spinning you faster and faster until everything goes topsy-turvy and you drift off into unconsciousness. Sounds like a thrilling way to spice up a dull office day, doesn't it? Back in the 1800s, when understanding of mental illness was as murky as the depths of the forbidden forest, doctors believed that conditions like schizophrenia were caused by imbalances in the brain. And so, they concocted all sorts of wild treatments in a desperate bid to restore harmony to the mind. Whirling chair, one of the many peculiar remedies dreamed up in those days of medical experimentation. The idea was simple, yet utterly bonkers spin the patient around until their brain gets a good jiggling, hopefully shaking loose whatever evil spirits were causing trouble up there. Imagine being strapped into a whirlwind of a chair, like a human-sized spin cycle in a washing machine. Patients risked dizziness, nausea, and even physical harm with no guarantee of relief from their affliction. Cannibalism in medicine. In ancient times, cannibalistic remedies were believed to possess magical healing properties, and various body parts and remains were used as treatments for different ailments. The procedures involved in administering these remedies varied depending on the specific remedy being used. Mummy powder, made from ground-up mummified remains, was believed to have therapeutic effects and was used to treat conditions such as headaches. You'd either swallow it down or slap it onto your skin talk about a DIY remedy straight out of the secret scrolls of Cleopatra's beauty regimen. Similarly, human fat was believed to alleviate muscle aches. Rubbing it onto your skin at the site of pain was supposed to do the trick. And let's not forget about drinking the blood of a gladiator to treat epilepsy. Now that's taking fighting fire with fire to a whole new level. But as the sands of time shifted and the light of reason began to dawn, the truth behind these ghastly remedies emerged from the shadows. During ancient times and up until the 18th century, the understanding of cannibalistic remedies by doctors and the scientific community was based on the belief that the patient would benefit from the soul and spirit of the donor, whether living or deceased. It was believed that these remedies contained healing energy that could alleviate various ailments. Consuming human body parts or remains does not possess any therapeutic benefits and can actually pose serious health risks. Ingesting mummified remains, human fat, or blood can introduce harmful pathogens into the body and increase the risk of infection and disease transmission. Additionally, the idea that the soul or spirit of the donor could transfer healing energy to the recipient has no basis in scientific reality. Cupping therapy. Cupping therapy is a traditional medical practice that involves placing cups on the skin to create suction. The suction is believed to promote blood flow and healing for various ailments, including pain and inflammation. During cupping therapy, cups are typically placed on specific points on the body 
and left in place for a short period of time, creating a vacuum effect that draws blood to the surface of the skin. While cupping therapy may cause temporary changes in blood flow and tissue perfusion, these effects are likely to be transient and may not have a significant impact on long-term health outcomes. So, as we reflect on the bizarre remedies of yesteryear, let us also celebrate the progress we have made. Let us honor the resilience of the human spirit and the unwavering pursuit of truth.